Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome in to another edition of Don't Call This a Podcast. I am your, or one of your hosts, Ryan McLaughlin, and here with me, as always, is Courtney Campbell. How are you doing today, Courtney? We're good. Um, as I just told um, Representative Clark, is that I have my, um, because we have two women on tonight, I have a sweater that says a woman's place is in the House and the Senate. I'm going to so enlarge never, I'll just, here. I'll just. Like this, so yeah, and yes, I am uncomfortably warm, but I had to bring it out for something like this because women are greatly um, underrepresented in Congress, and especially women of color. So it's excellent to have you on, um, Dr. Clark. So thank you. So thank speaking you. of which, our guest today is uh, Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark. Um, I'm going to do my my uh, my intro for you real quick, and then uh, we'll kind of let you talk a little bit about yourself. Um, she's a Georgia native who has long aspired to be a scientist. She completed her bachelor's at the University of Tennessee before returning home and earning a PhD in microbiology from Emory University. She's a longtime activist and organizer. Dr. Clark has worked with groups such as March for Science, the Georgia Alliance for Social Justice. She's a mother of two and a senior lecturer at the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory University. Inspired to run because she believes that politics needs more scientists Hailing from my hometown of Lilburn, please welcome, as my microphone falls over, please welcome Dr. Jasmine Clark, representative of Georgia's 108th district in the state assembly. Dr. Clark, how are you doing today? Oh, I am doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you for that awesome introduction. And um, it is nice to have a fellow Lilburnite, um, on, or, you know, nice to be on with a fellow Lilburnite. And Courtney, I love the sweater. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Well, we thank you as always for taking time out your day. We know you're extremely busy, um, you know, with two children, uh, regardless of age, uh, going through this current pandemic, also trying to campaign. That's a lot. That's a lot. So we just thank you for taking the time out this afternoon. And we'll go ahead and jump right into things. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about you outside the state assembly. You studied at UT Knoxville, but then came back home. What compelled you to return? Were you always going to come home? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I went off to UT Knoxville um, pretty much um, uh, to the chagrin of my parents who wanted me to use the Hope Scholarship to go to UGA, but I didn't want to go to UGA because I wanted to get a different experience. I wanted to leave the state. I wanted to meet new people. And I felt like UGA was almost an extension of my high school. And so I uh, applied to schools and I got a full scholarship at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And so I went there, I did my four years. And then after that, I um, actually went to graduate school for one year in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, uh, simultaneously, while starting uh, graduate school, I also uh, started my family. And that right when I got to graduate school, about two weeks later, um, me and then my, my now ex-husband found out that I was um, going to have a baby. And so then I had a decision to make. And so um, I decided because um, most of my support system is here in Georgia, I was in graduate school, the first year of graduate school, and I really wanted to have a robust support system. So I decided to move back to Georgia, back home where my parents were, where my um, ex-husband's parents were. And um, I wanted to start my family in Georgia, in Atlanta, instead of in Birmingham. So I applied to transfer to Emory University. I uh, was accepted and um, here is where I am now. So the reason we both threw our hands up, and this was totally not planned, because <laughs> I did planned. not know that part about you. Did you happen to be at an institution with a little dragon on it? Um, uh, while you were at, or were you at Miles or? I was at UAB. Yeah, uh, okay. Yes. Sorry, I'm an alumni and so is Ryan. So that's why we got oh so excited. Oh my gosh, that's so weird. That is yeah. a coincidence. Yes, no, that was not planned. I did not know. That is not normally in my bio because it's such a short amount of time mm -hmm. that I kind of like don't really know where to fit it in. So I just never put that part of my bio, but that's really awesome. Yeah, I was there in the biomedical sciences program there and um, I uh, was in an integrated biomedical sciences uh, graduate program but I ended up uh, coming over to Emory and joining the um, uh, microbiology and molecular genetics program at Emory. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, because I'm just trying to connect timelines here now, about what time frame was that when you were over there in Birmingham? 2005 to 2006. Right before I was there. 
that is that is a very okay so um so yeah no totally not playing it just so people can see i'm wearing my uab polo i usually don't wear my I'll uab show, stuff or, I'll show or, my mug i, I, I love, love it i love it Totally not planned, but that is very interesting to hear. So, and both um, Emory and UAB are both excellent institutions, and that just are. kind of speaks to just what an you know how much intellect you have to be able to get both into UAB's program and Emory's because both are like very highly competitive, from what I know. Oh, so, yeah, it was definitely a competitive uh, situation. So, yeah, it was it was amazing. Well, moving forward, uh, just kind of you know talking a little bit about you a little bit further. In your biography on your website, you say that you had scientific curiosity at a very young age. What were some of the things that you did that make you look back on your childhood and say, yeah, this was kind of, this was destiny? I I think um, it's more so just the way my brain worked. At a very young age, I was always that kid that asked a lot of questions. I was inquisitive. And so even now when I meet children who are very inquisitive and they're they're constantly asking questions and they're just just seem to want to know more about what's going on in the world, I encourage them to go into science because I don't think that we encourage students to go into science careers enough. And there are a lot of people out there that would make great researchers and great scientists and really contribute to the body of science just because they're in because of their inquisitive nature. But not just that. I followed my dad around all the time. My dad is a doctor. And um, uh, when my mom and my dad got divorced, uh, if my dad's weekend happened to also be a weekend that he was on call, then we would just go with him to the hospital or to, you know, wherever he was on call. We just kind of hang out there until he got done with patients and then we would go on. So I really kind of um, watched him, you know, be a caregiver. And, you know, I watched his dedication to patients and to his job. And of course, we weren't in the exam room, but we were there. And I knew what he was doing. And so I just kind of always grew up thinking, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor just like my dad. And I did not quite become a, a doctor like my dad. I did become a doctor. and I do have a PhD, but I did not become a medical doctor. Gotcha. And what was what was his, his practice, his specialty? Internal medicine. So he was just, he's just an internist and um, he, uh, he had a focus on uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And so we would go to a lot of conferences. I, a lot of my traveling as a, a young child was just going to medical conferences. And like my dad would take us with him. He'd do the conference stuff during the day and we had a sitter during the day. And then after um, the conference things, then we would do whatever, you know, events, or things, attractions they had in that particular city. So I traveled a lot as a kid, going to medical conferences and then getting to like, you know, experience different cities around the country. Uh, just kind of, I didn't write this one down, but just piggybacking off of that, what was probably one of your favorite cities to visit? Um, I would say San Diego. Um, I really enjoyed visiting San Diego. That was really fun. And my second uh, favorite would probably be San Antonio. Actually, I actually really had, as a kid, that was a really fun place to visit. Awesome. All right. Well, and you have two younger children. Um, well, I say younger within context. You have two children. Um, do you see those those qualities? I mean, you said that your father is the reason why you uh, had the same focus that you do now or that you kind of went into the, the medical side of things or the scientific side of things earning your doctorate. Do you see that with any of your children? I do. I, I think I especially see it with my daughter. Um, my daughter is uh, turning into quite the little activist and she really does pay attention to politics. Um, she is convinced that she will be um, the first female president. Um, I hope that is not the case, not because I don't believe in my daughter and don't think that she could do it, but she is very far from the uh, minimum age to be president. And I just hope we don't have to wait that long. Um, but she, you know, she does aspire to be in politics and very different from me. I came at this from a very unconventional route, um, but with her, She's not only she not only sees me in politics and sees, you know, all the things that I'm doing and how much work I put in, how much care I put into um, this role. Uh, but she's also around other powerful women like she's had a chance to meet Kamala Harris, you know, before Kamala was the vice presidential nominee. Um, she 
she shook hands. She had a conversation with Kamala Harris. And so now to like see that same person that you have a picture with when you were, she was little, she was probably, I guess she's 12 now. So around 10, around 10 years of age. And, you know, and now seeing that, um, seeing that same person running for a uh, vice president, you know, and then just being around other women and just other people in positions of power in general. I think that she is just in that, even though I had my father who kind of steered me toward the sciences, I think I've kind of steered her toward, she's gonna be a leader in something like that. It's not even questionable for her. What are some of those things that she, she that she sees you do? Uh, I think a lot of times with these interviews, we haven't really dug deep into the details of that day to day. How do you interact with your constituents? What are some of those things that you do as a representative pre and you know mid pandemic? Um, that <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, because those are two very different things. So pre pandemic, um, my daughter came to the Capitol with me a lot. Um, she actually got to see the process. She saw, you know, what we do on the floor. She saw what we do in committee hearings. She sees me interacting with my constituents that come to see me at the Capitol. Like she really got a chance to really see the entire process from the inside. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, meet some amazing people along the way, because, you know, if I'm having to do something, um, you know, you know, one of my staffers might, you um, be going to a hearing and then just kind of take her, you know, with her to the hearing, uh, with them to the hearing. Mm. So, um, but, so she got to see me in action at the Capitol. But a lot of times, what a lot of people don't realize um, is even though we are a part-time legislature and that um, technically we only work 40 days, that's not true. We are working every single day of the year, 365 days. Yes, even on weekends, we are working. And so she sees how much work I put into answering constituent emails, attending events, putting on town halls, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, visiting, having um, meetings with um, constituents in the district, uh, all of those different things. She is very intimately um, familiar with the campaign trail and understanding like what it takes to campaign, how it feels to fundraise, uh, recruit volunteers, you know, canvas, uh, phone bank. She has seen all of it. And so she's getting a, you know, up close and personal view that a lot of people do not get. Um, and so the fact that after seeing all this, she still is like, yeah, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I, I must be doing something right because, yeah, even some days I'm like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> Um, can I kind of pick back in with like an unwritten question? Um, because something struck out to me just when you mentioned your daughter getting to meet Kamala Harris and being able to see another woman um, in, in that kind of power. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, right before we went live, is that you um, are in two fields where women, especially women of color, are greatly underrepresented in science and in both politics. How do you feel about having, because I feel like that almost has a weight on your shoulders how do you feel about that? And then how do you feel about what that does for younger girls that see women like you and see women like Kamala Harris in, the, in, in positions of power? What kind of impact do you think that has? So that's a really good question because you're right. It is a lot. It is uh, definitely a lot trying to always uh, be above um go above and beyond at everything that I do. I do not feel like that I have the luxury to be subpar when it comes to the the sciences and teaching. You know, I feel like I have to deliver above and beyond what others um, might feel like they have to do because I am underrepresented. And so I do feel like I am almost like, um, one of a small number of spokespeople or models of what a black woman scientist is and does, um, and a black woman scientist who is also in the classroom. Um, I And then at the same time, when it comes to legislating the same way, I do feel like there is more of a microscope pun intended, because I am a microbiologist, there is more of a microscope on me um, being um, in an underrepresented uh, group in that uh, there are not a lot of Black women um, legislators. Now, in Georgia, 
we do um, have the, the largest legislative black caucus. So there are a lot of black legislators here in Georgia, but still, um, you know, across the country um, and even in Georgia, even though we have the largest legislative black caucus, um, black women are still underrepresented. And especially when you look at leadership positions, black women are even within like politics, we are still underrepresented in a lot of the leadership positions. And so it's a lot. Um, it is burdensome, but it's a it's a it's a burden I'm willing to bear because I think that it is important to pave that path. Um, I, I I operate on the philosophy of um, impact and the fact that I am here to leave some type of impact. And if that impact is that someone saw me and was inspired by me or motivated by me to do something, to go into science, to go into politics, to speak up for something that they care about. If, if I at least get one other person to be impacted or motivated or inspired to do better and to do good in the world, then I will feel like I was successful and accomplished my life goal, which was just to be impactful. That's really beautiful. Does <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Courtney, before we jumped into the, um, you know, questions regarding the campaign and, and legislation, was there anything else you wanted to ask, uh, Dr. Clark? No, that's it. And again, I just wanted to thank you, um, you know, just as a woman and, you know, on behalf, I'm sure it's like, especially as a black woman, just the representation that you do provide, um, because I'm sure some days you don't feel like you have the impact, especially when it gets harder, but you absolutely do. And you're doing something really inspirational with that. So thank you. Thank you. See you. And Courtney, at any point in time with these questions, feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of give a little background as we talked about. Usually there are three of us that do some of these interviews. Um, Courtney and Ron have been particularly tied up today, uh, so they weren't able to really help craft the questions. So feel free to jump in with any questions that you have, Courtney. Um, but we'll kind of, you know, sashay that direction. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the first time you ran in 2018. Um, you, like a lot of other Democrats who ran for the first time in that cycle um, within the state assembly, won a very close race. Um, it was, I think, less than 200 votes separated you from your opponent. Um, I know you mentioned your desire to see kind of science and actual facts uh, represented, as we uh, saw at the forefront of that VP debate last night. Um, but what did you learn from such a tough race in, in being able to communicate your message, your platform to people? What really stuck out uh, to you about that time in 2018? I would like, I think that the biggest message or the biggest lesson I learned from 2018 is that every vote counts. And I know that sounds cliche and I know that sounds like, oh, you know, everyone says that and your vote is your voice and all this stuff. And all of those things are true. And I am a living testimony to just how true that is. Um, when I would knock on doors in 2018, I would tell people, and a lot of it was education because a lot of people didn't even know what a state representative was. And I would tell people, you are, you could very well be the one vote that gets me over the finish line because it is a, it is a, you know, winner take all. So, you know, I could win or lose by one vote and you could be that one vote. And so um, that was my, um, you know, that was what I would tell voters when I spoke to them. And, you know, I was saying that, I mean, I, I believe that um, when I was saying it, but I think on election night, it, uh, it really hit home. As the numbers were coming in um, on election night, actually at the end of the of the night and when i say end of the night i'm saying like when most of the numbers had to come in i actually was not winning um i had one and a half precincts left to be counted on election night now the the, the two precincts that were left were um some of the larger precincts, um, they have some of the most voters in any precinct I have in my district. And they are traditionally uh, Democratic precincts. So the difference between, between me winning and losing was legitimately how many people showed up in those last two precincts. And so it was so important. It was a nail biter. 
And when I did win by that few hundred votes, uh, it, it really, again, brought home the point of like just how important each individual person is. And so I still carry that with me today. I do not take a single vote for granted. I do not feel like I have the luxury to alienate or ignore or, um, you know, to to push aside voters as if they don't matter because they all do. And any given person or group of people could change the outcome of the election. And um, that was me coming in as a newcomer. Um, my opponent back then did not take me seriously. And so um, I don't know what he was saying at the doors. I don't know how he was campaigning. But I know that when I am campaigning in 2020, I am spending a lot of time, um, even though I'm not knocking on doors, the voter contact that I do have, I do spend time letting people know that I do not take their vote for granted. So what are those conversations like, um, you know, when you're going door to door, uh, you know, a lot of times, again, I mean, our, our, our viewpoints have kind of shifted because we've been in a pandemic for what feels like 25 years. But kind of talk about that process a little bit. When you're knocking on somebody's door, you're going to talk to somebody, the stranger shows up and they're asking for a vote. What are what are kind of the ways, you know, you talked about your vote could be the one that put me over the top. But what are some of the ways that you that you what are the, those questions that you get and how do you kind of explain that to people um, as far as your role in the state legislature? So that's the exact question I get. So when I first knock on a door, usually uh, one of the first questions, not always, but one of the first questions is, how did you get my how do you know my name? Like, how are you knocking on my door and how do you know my name? And then I explained to them that, you know, the voter uh, rolls are available to campaigns and we are able to, you know, find voters that are registered um, through a database. Um, and then the next question is, well, what is, what is the state representative? Are you running to go to Washington? And I'm like, no, I'm running to make state laws. And then usually I highlight some state laws so people really know what I do. So I'll say, you know, I, um, I'm running to, uh, uh, decide on the state budget, how we st spend state money. Uh, you know, uh, back in 2018, uh, the, a big law that made a lot of media was the texting and driving law. Mm -hmm. So I would say the texting and driving law, that's a state law. Um, also in 2018, Stacey Abrams was running for governor. Mm -hmm. And I would explain to people that I am running to be in the legislature under Stacey Abrams, if Stacey Abrams is to win. So uh, just a, a lot of canvassing is education. like. Mm -hmm. A lot of voters just don't know. And it's not their fault. I don't think we talk or teach enough about down ballot races. We talk so much about president. We we know. I mean, honestly, most people probably don't even know what the vice president does. And most people probably don't realize that the role of vice president is not so much um you know, there's not a lot that the vice president does when it comes to like policy and things like that. And it's more of a, a tiebreaker for the Senate. And, you know, um, you know, just kind of like I would say almost an advisory role, but not necessarily like a leadership or policy role. Um, it is a leadership role, not a policy role. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when I'm um, when I'm talking to to voters and I'm just trying to explain to them, I just realize that. A lot of people just don't know. And then from there, they'll ask me, uh, usually there's something on their mind and they'll ask me, well, what do you think about this? So they'll say stuff like, well, what do you think about healthcare? Or why do my prescriptions cost so much? And how can you fix that? And, or they'll ask me tough questions like, well, what do you feel about abortion? And what do you feel about uh, the police and things like that? And then we have those conversations, but either way, like, it's an opportunity to have conversations with people, which is why it's really difficult in 2020, because um, as a virologist, as a microbiologist, I do not feel comfortable going door to door and potentially perpetuating the spread of COVID-19 in our community just to get votes. Mm -hmm. And so I have not knocked on doors. And so a lot of those conversations have to actually have been more happenstance, like talking to people in their neighborhoods or virtual meet and greets. Um, virtual town halls where I'm answering questions or, um, you know, uh, and, and phone and and mostly phone. And then sometimes I get a lot of questions on my website. People email me questions and I answer them that way. 
Okay. Well, I think I've made you explain a lot about the process of planning. <laughs> Um, so let's actually talk about you know some of the things that you've done on the House floor um, because you have a pretty extensive record. Uh, for those that don't know, you live in Georgia. You can go um, on the website. I'll put it up on here uh, a little bit later on, but you can go on the website and actually search what each uh, representative, especially your representative, um, has sponsored or co-sponsored through House resolutions and House bills. So I do want to talk about a few of those, uh, notably the first one. Um, you know, of course, you've based your agenda on uh, education, voting rights, reproductive rights, and more. Um, but one bill you highlighted on your uh, on your website that I wanted to cover is HB 133. Uh, you you were the primary sponsor of this, and it seeks to uh, offer medically accurate sex education information, particularly regarding HIV prevention. Um, and I believe this is the first piece of legislation you ever brought to the floor. Yes. Which really highlights your scientific background, your, your <laughs> scientific mind. So can you talk about uh, that a little bit? Uh, what was the inspiration for that? Uh, kind of where are we in that process? I understand what we're dealing with in terms of the governor and, and some of, you know, some people across the aisle. But can you talk about the process behind that that bill and kind of what you hope to achieve with that? Yeah, absolutely. So I cannot take 100% credit for that bill. That actually is a constituent bill. And what I mean by constituent bill is that a constituent brought this issue to me. This particular constituent is a parent in the district whose child was in middle school. And this parent was very upset about the type of sex education that was being taught in Gwinnett County. So just a very brief background of sex education in Gwinnett County. I'm not sure if you went to high school in Gwinnett County, you may or may not remember this, but pretty much it is a curriculum that focuses on, excuse me, on prevention of teen pregnancy. There's nothing wrong with wanting to prevent teen pregnancy, but I think there is a difference between pregnancy prevention education and sex education. Um, sex is more than just trying to prevent pregnancy. Um, and also a lot of the curriculum, not only was it about teen pregnancy prevention, but it focused heavily on um, the female students and their role in preventing pregnancy. And also it focused a lot on how uh, valuable their genitals were. And how, uh, which, you know, I'm not saying that our genitals are not valuable, but what I'm saying is um, it basically uh, correlated um, having sex with uh, being ruined. And so um, that's a very disturbing way, in my opinion, of teaching what should be a freaking biology class. Like this should be biology. Like this should be science. This should not be you know, a religious based class that basically, um, you know, teaches girls that they are ruined. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, regardless of your personal philosophy on sex. And, you know, I'm a mother. So and I'm, I have a daughter. Of course, I don't want my daughter to have sex before she gets married and all those things. That is definitely my wish. And that is how I teach her in my home. But when I send my daughter to school, I expect her to get an objective education, not a subjective one that is subjective on the basis of religion and on the basis of somebody's value system um, that uh, may not necessarily be the value system of everyone in the school system and definitely not the religion of everyone in the school system, especially when we're talking about Gwinnett County. Um, and so, um, Medically accurate sex education is just that. Teach it in from the context of being medically accurate. And while you're at it, if you're going to teach about AIDS, which is what they teach now, actually teach about HIV and specifically prevention of HIV and not this doom and gloom, fire and brimstone, you know, um, you know, chastity driven uh, sex education that actually it has been shown, there's data to show, it has uh, less of an impact on preventing, you know, uh, lifelong uh, illnesses like HIV and preventing pregnancy um, when compared to comprehensive 
sex education, which other countries and other locations actually do use. And, you know, I am a, I am a believer that education is power. Information is power. And instead of trying to hide it or scare people out of doing something um, that is a normal uh, biological process, let's actually teach them about what it is, what's going on, and ways to do it safely if that is a decision that is made by that individual. So I do want to uh, kind of expound upon that a little bit when you talked about constituency bills, um, because a lot of what we try and do with this show is to talk about, as you mentioned before, down ballot races, the importance of them, but to also really demonstrate the power that people have. So can you talk about constituency bills? Is there another bill that you've um, brought to the floor that was a constituency bill? Um, how can people go about uh, sort of making something like this happen? Yeah, so that's the beauty of being a rep representative is I am basically a, a conduit. I am the quote middleman between what you want as a constituent and um, the process. And so uh, other constituent bills include uh, my resolution for a um, uh, study committee on the effects of gun violence on mental health. That was another bill that was brought to me by students, actually. Um, a group of students from Parkview High School actually brought other bills to me related to gun violence because of their concerns about feeling safe in school. And so um, a lot of times people think that politicians are like up here and they're down here and they've got to jump through hoops, climb through all these different steps to get up here. But that's not the way I operate my office. My office is an open door. I have an open door policy. I listen to my constituents and I try to um, come with bills um, that um, are going to help them. And so this is where it is really important to number one, know who your representative is. And when there is a situation or there's something wrong or something going on that you feel needs to be addressed, contact your representative and talk through that with them and see if you can come up with something that might need to be legislated. Sometimes the issue doesn't even need to be legislated. Sometimes the issue just needs to be fixed and your representative can do that as well. I'll, I'll butt in. Um, just going to give you some background of me. I, I'm a social worker, um, being very careful about where it is. Um, a lot of people don't know this, even when it comes to small things, like if you fall for benefits and you're not getting an answer, a lot of people reach out to the representatives and the representatives can actually reach out to state agencies and get it pushed along faster. So even something as small as that, um, I really urge the importance of. And if you don't mind if I butt in one more time, Ryan, um, I actually, I, I just love it because um, my, my degree is in social work and actually my exiting essay was on, it was a mock grant on the importance of comprehensive sex education. So oh <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why my, I, I put my eyes lit up and I was like fervently nodding because all the same points. <laughs> and I actually sent that whole dissertation to, I, in Alabama to my representative. I didn't get an exciting answer. But um, I one thing I like when I kind of was giving, you know, getting kind of my qualitative um, answers and polls from parents was kind of a f they, they had a fear that this kind of knowledge would, might cause their children to, I guess, be more sexually active or possibly, you know, at home you can teach, you know, wait until marriage, but they were afraid that having that kind of comprehensive education would lead to the opposite. What would you kind of say to, to parents that were that had, that had those concerns with, with, you know, comprehensive sex education like that? I get that concern. Again, mm -hmm. I am a parent first, you know, before being a scientist, before being um, all of these other things, I'm mommy. And so I completely understand that parental perspective of, you know, uh, teaching such education, which is why I said it should be taught like science and it should not be taught um, from this very, what I consider values based uh, approach. Um, but what I will say is that we have data from other countries and as well as other locations that do offer comprehensive sex education, that that is not the case. We also have um, anecdotal evidence from students who uh, were unfortunately not taught and um, 
engaged in risky sexual behaviors um, because regardless of what their parents were telling them, you know, they they still had that curiosity and they engage and now they are living with lifelong illnesses. Um, but then we also have the anecdotal evidence of the person who was taught. And then when they began to engage in sexual activity, um, they were equipped with the knowledge on how to protect themselves. Um, we have to be really careful about teaching um, kids about being ruined if they're having sex. Um, and the reason why is because you do not know everyone in the room's story. Um, for example, um, another uh, really sad example of why comprehensive sex education that does not focus on the, you know, um, ruining of uh, female genitalia is um, a student in one of those classes was actually uh, being molested. And um, they, after, go, you know, hearing this, they did not want to disclose. They did not want to tell anybody that they were being molested because they were so afraid that their body was ruined. And they didn't want anyone to know that. And so um, that that's dangerous, you know, get in, putting things into, you know, we're talking about middle schoolers here. They're very impressionable um, and preventing them from, you know, telling someone that someone is is, is harming them um, because they are so they're more afraid of the social backlash of that than protecting themselves and protecting, uh, you know, from a predator, um, that's a dangerous way. So I think we need to, again, approach sex education as a, a an extension of health class, an extension of biology class, and not an extension of, um, uh, or, or not some type of like uh, religious course and a values-based course, um, because I really truly believe that it should be the, the home environment that teaches you know those values, because it's gonna be different in different households. Absolutely, um, and, and I'm glad you brought up when we talked about that, the constituency bill, um, you know, you had uh, Parker, or Parkview High School students bring up uh, uh, constituency bills about gun laws, and you are a part of, or you've been an advocate for common sense gun laws. So including a bill that you've co-sponsored that would prohibit the sale of firearms to those convicted of misdemeanor crimes of family violence uh, from buying, receiving, transporting, or possessing um, a firearm. Uh, there are people who would say that this is a violation of the Second Amendment. Um, how do you kind of differentiate and, and, and sort of assure people that this is something that is a protective measure uh, to, to help others? How do you kind of, when you get those kind of questions, especially door to door, um, how do you answer that? Well, uh, the truth is there is a um, very sad, very disturbing correlation between uh, domestic violence and um, gun violence. Um, and um, we uh, and this bill would potentially save so many lives by keeping guns out of the hands of people who are more likely to use those guns against a, a, a partner. Mm -hmm. um, so when you bring up the Second Amendment, that's a really interesting argument because right now, if you're a convicted felon, you also cannot get a gun. So it's no different than that. It's just an extension of that. And the, the rationale behind it is pretty much the same. Um, you know, I, I always find it funny, um, kind of funny how uh, how people always cling to the Second Amendment at, um, for reasons why we should not keep people safe and why we should not keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. Um, but um, you ask that same person about uh, voting rights for people who are incarcerated or people who have been convicted of a felony, and they will tell you without, uh, you know, without even hesitation, well, they did the crime and they should lose their voting rights. And it's just very interesting to me how people care a whole lot about the uh, Second Amendment, but all the other amendments don't seem to hold as much weight and hold as much water to them as the, uh, the Second Amendment does. And so I would just say to them that we make laws like this all the time, and um, it is not a violation of uh, the 
it is not a violation of the Second Amendment. And if it was a violation of the Second Amendment, then, um, I mean, the argument would be then we need to put the guns back in the hand of every convicted criminal, no matter what they're convicted of. And do you agree with that? Mm-hmm. And, you know, usually no one's going to agree with that. So it's very well said in an approach <laughs> that I had not thought about or, or taken an extent to. So I appreciate that response and that answer. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you. You're a member of the Committee of on Higher Education. So um, I myself am somebody who's involved in higher ed, been involved in higher ed for the last eight years and not just through student loan debt. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you are part of a, uh, one, one thing that you brought to the floor uh, would issue a waiver to students who serve as graduate teaching or research assistants uh, part time or full time. Um, this is something that I don't think a lot of people realize uh, uh, is an issue or just kind of how difficult it can be uh, to be a, a, a graduate teaching or research assistant. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of that, uh, why you consider that significant legislation and just kind of breaking down uh, what that does for those students? So uh, that is another bill that was brought to me um, by, uh, I think it was the uh, campus workers. Uh, and um, no, I think it was the campus workers. Don't, I, I hope I'm not misquoting that. But um, basically, well, when it comes to the fees, graduate students, um, and I don't, I, I'm not sure, have you, do, have you done grad school, Ryan? I just finished my master's in July. Okay, right. so then you can attest to this. Mm-hmm. You are, yes, you may be on campus, and yes, you may, you know, do some of the, you know, activities and things like that. But for the most part, graduate school is kind of separated from the undergraduate experience. But the fees are are, are not separated from that. And um, I think that um, when you go in and you, and I, hold on, I'm, hopefully I'm not getting my bills mixed up and I probably should have prepared for that question. But um, when you are a, a graduate student and you're a graduate student worker, um, you are basically working to get a paycheck, but then it's almost like your pay is like negated or subtracted from by all the extra fees and stuff that you end up having to pay. Mm-hmm. And so you're not really getting to take home as much or you're not really making as much as a graduate student as you would be, even though you're not really necessarily using all of those other things. And so this is really just a way to empower um, those graduate student TAs, those graduate student workers to kind of hold on to more of their money. It's already hard enough. You're in grad school, you're trying to work. Um, and now you you almost need another job just to even make ends meet. And so it's just a way to help our campus um, workers and our, our, our graduate students um, in, their, in that process. Because again, it's just, these are normally adults. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times they're adults with families. And, um, you know, they're going through grad school or they're, you know, they're, they're trying to work their way through this. And um, it just, uh, a lot of times those fees just present, per, present more hurdles. That I think really, I addressed the right, I hope I addressed the right bill. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I think you did there. Um, that one really <laughs> stuck out to me as uh, um, somebody who's worked for now four different institutions and just worked with um, students, both undergraduate and graduate students, trying to help them navigate certain things. To see something yes. like that is something that I don't think people realize how difficult it can be. Um, and so I'm glad that you have uh, attempted to address that um, in some and, way. And can I just butt in uh, really quickly and say that was brought to me by graduate students. So students came, they came to the Capitol, they talked with me about the issue. And then it's kind of like, is this something that could be fixed with legislation? And the answer was yes. And so that's what we did. And so uh, that did not make it, um, it did not get signed or anything like that. I don't even think it made it through co- the committee process. But again, those things can be brought back up again in the upcoming legislative session. Absolutely. So speaking of just sort of, um, I don't want to say gridlock, but speaking of more of current events, uh, over the last week, Governor Kemp has built or started building an eight foot tall fence surrounding the Capitol, seemingly in response to the protests that have occurred over the city over the last few months. I see the smile on your face. (laughs) I wanted to bring up your tweet specifically uh, because your 
your tweet is what made me start digging into this and reading about this because I didn't know it was happening until I read your tweet, um, where you said, quote, who in the world asked for this? The state capital is the people's house, not some untouchable fortress. It should be open and welcoming, not gated and intimidating. Uh, what do you think Governor Kemp is trying to accomplish here? And what do you think he's scared of? So it's funny that you mentioned that you weren't really aware of it until my tweet, because I really wasn't aware of it until right before that tweet. Um, <laughs> no one told us. That's why my first question was, who in the world asked for this? Like, it was kind of like we woke up in the morning and I was like, oh, yeah, um, by the way, we're building an eight foot tall fence that costs five million dollars. And it's like, what? Why? Um, you know, I don't want to feel imprisoned in the state capitol as a legislator. And I do not want the people to feel locked out of their own house. That is the people's house. That's what we call it. We call it the people's house. And that's what it should feel like. I'm sorry, but putting an eight foot fence up does not make anything feel welcoming. Nothing feels welcoming. Nothing says, um, you are not welcome here, like a big, shiny, eight foot tall fence. Um, and, you know, to answer your question about motivation, I've been asking myself the same thing. Um, are we trying to protect the Confederate statues that um, are do uh, dotted around the Capitol? Are we trying to protect um, the, the, the people inside who are making uh, laws or voting on things that are physically harming people's lives and costing some people their life. What are what are we why what are we trying to block when we put up a big fence? And what is the Republican obsession with freaking fences and walls? Like I don't get it. It's just so it, it's a trend now. I mean, have you seen what happened at the White House? I visited the White House in I believe it was 2018. And the difference between where you can stand and how close you can get to the White House now versus when I went a couple of years ago, um, it's it's a it's amazing. Um, we've been pushed out, pushed back, and blocked out, and now it seems like we're doing that right here in our home, and it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I can't speak to the governor's motives because I have not spoken to the governor about this. Um, they say it's about security, uh, but I uh, personally feel like it is the wrong way and it sends the wrong message. I find it interesting that you brought up the fences or that you brought up the uh, Republican fences and uh, because it made me think of what Birmingham did um, while people were wanting to tear down the box, uh, the statues and the state said, you can't do that. So they built boxes around the <laughs> around the Confederate statues uh, to essentially block them out. So I, I found it interesting that you said that because in one <laughs> instance, it was doing something that people actually wanted, which was getting rid of these statues in, in a majority black city. Uh, and then in this instance, you're blocking people out of uh, of, of a Capitol building that is there. So um, in order to protect Confederate statues. <laughs> right. So. Um, I find that very interesting. So just kind of staying on that point, we brought up in the beginning of this when we talked about your initial run in 2018, um, just the number of seats that were flipped. And of course, uh, you know, we're trying to kind of repeat that same process uh, here in 2020. Um, the blue wave was not just at the U.S. House of Representatives. It happened at a lot of in a lot of state races around the country. Um, and you're part of that. So I do want to I want to commend that. But I also want to say, um, you know, a lot of people that are trying to uh, run for these seats. Um, or who are running for re-election, people like Sam Park, people like Rebecca Mitchell, um, they are wanting to do things like expand access to Medicaid, um, give more power to workers in unions. Uh, have you seen a shift in how the electorate here in Georgia, specifically in your district, um, and just kind of, you know, uh, looking at Gwinnett County, when I moved here way back in the early 90s, it was a different Gwinnett County than it is now. Um, so how do you see the demographic here changing uh, do you see them embracing those ideals uh, and maybe having a better understanding of what those things actually mean? So the answer is yes. Um, the truth is um, there are very few people uh, who would look you in the face and tell you that um, they do not want people to have access to health care. Like very few people would tell you that. Um, now, there are some, but 
not a lot of people would say that. Um, and even in other states where the governor, uh, usually a Republican governor, has rejected expanding Medicaid, when the citizens put the measure on the ballot, something we can't do in Georgia, but in states where ballot measures are allowed, the people overwhelmingly voted yes on expanding Medicaid. So when we talk about uh, these policies, um, you know, the, the Republicans will try to make it partisan and they will try to tell you that that's, oh, that's just something that the Democrats want. But when you bring it to the people, especially in rural Georgia, where their hospitals are literally closing, their hospitals are dropping like flies. And the amount of uncompensated care is just unbearable for those hospital systems. They will tell you that, um, yes, we want, we need this. This is something that our community needs so we don't lose another hospital or so that I don't have to drive an hour to take my kid to the pediatrician for a physical or so that I don't have to drive an hour to go to an OBGYN because there's literally no hospital or no place for me to have a baby within 40 miles of my home. So um, yeah, we uh, these are these are not unpopular things just because they are democratic things. Um, and I think if you were to take the individual um, these individual things and you you take them for what they are for what they what they do. Expanding Medicaid gives more people in our communities access to health care. It gives more people in Georgia access to health care, affordable care, so people can go to the doctor, so people can go to get checkups. And so you're not waiting till you are deathly ill in order to go to the doctor. Um, no one is real. There's not a lot of people who are against that when you actually talk it out with them. Um, and even other things like uh, living wage and, and you know, um, making sure that people um, are, are paid properly. You know, th these things are not unpopular when you explain them to people. Sound bites, you can convince, you can, uh, you can trick someone with a sound bite. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you give enough time to actually talk it through, most of the things that are on the Democratic platform, there are very few people who would disagree with the intention of those things. Um, and so I think that right now in a pandemic, we are now seeing the effects of Republican policies on the ability to uh, contain a deadly virus. And we are seeing the effects of so many in our community not having health insurance. And we are seeing the effects of, you know, a lot of people needing to be on unemployment and, you know, uh, that unemployment not being there or not showing up and then you not being able to actually call anybody at the unemployment office. We are seeing um, the effects of, you know, just kind of a failure of leadership and it all kind of just came to a head. And, you know, if this pandemic might not have happened, then maybe people might have still been kind of drumming along and not really seeing how these policies um, actually um, have harmed Georgia. But we, we uh, that's not what happened. We got a pandemic virus and we got a real life example of how cutting, 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 spinning our budget down to the bone and um, not prioritizing, um, making sure that every Georgian has access to care and not prioritizing, um, making sure that we have uh, ample resources for students, ample technology for students in our state, making sure that there are areas, you know, I don't know where y'all live, but there are par parts of Georgia where people literally don't have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. Like that, and if you're in the metro area, that's probably unfathomable to you. Mm -hmm. But there are places in Georgia where, you know, the internet companies are like, it is not profitable for us to come out here and put towers out here. And, uh, you know, getting access to broadband internet is, is, is something that they just don't have. And so that should have been a priority. It's 2020. We should not have parts of our state that literally whole school systems really don't have access to adequate internet. Um, 
And so these are all things, again, um, that uh, kind of culminated, came together, came to a head. And so I see Georgians when I talk to them, when I look at polls and things like that, I see Georgians rejecting um, this, uh, these Republican policies that have put us where we are right now, which is not in a good place. Dr. or Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark, thank you so much for your time this evening. I would love uh, to be able to ask you a few more questions, um, but we're pressed for time. So I'm going to have to. Oh, guys, I'm kind of long winded. <laughs> no, you're okay. No, you're okay. Totally it's, fine. It's fantastic. I'm going to have to get you back here, though. Oh, I, I would love to. I would love to come back. Now that I know that y'all both went to UAB, I'm, I'm here. That's that's enough. <laughs> and, and I might send you a separate email just in some policy points with Medicaid as a social worker that I can't say separate. Um, I, I might be sending you an email a little bit later. Sounds good. Um, anything you want to plug or push before you get out of here? Um, we've got your mentions up here in your website, but is there anything that you want to, you want to highlight? Um, I just want to highlight that we have an election coming up in 26 days and it is absolutely incumbent upon every person listening to this and every person that knows every person listening to this, tell your friends, tell your neighbor, tell anyone who is an eligible voter, just how important this election is and make sure to participate in this upcoming election. There are so many ways to cast your ballot, whether it's by absentee, whether it's by voting early or whether it's choosing to vote on the last day to vote, which is November 3rd, 2020. Either way, please cast your ballot. Make your voice be heard. It is so absolutely important. And make sure to vote all the way down the ballot, including your state races and your county races and the ballot questions at the end of the ballot. And so that's all I have today. Visit my website if you want more information or if you have a question for me. I do have a place where you can ask questions and the answer comes directly from me. So um, I would love to hear from people. And that's jasmineclarkforgeorgia.com. Please make sure you go check the website out. If you have the means to do so, um, please be sure to make a donation. Um, Dr. Clark, <laughs> you were phenomenal. Um, we absolutely loved having you on today. Uh, we will be sure to send you the raw audio and video. So if you and your team want to do anything with it, you're more than welcome or able to do so. Um, please, 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 early voting in Georgia. If you live in Georgia, it starts um, on October the 12th. So we are four days away from the first bit of early voting. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to vote for Dr. Clark, but I will be able to vote for another fantastic candidate and Rebecca mm -hmm. Mitchell. Um, so we're going to try and flip District 106. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you so much. Make sure you go follow her on Twitter. And uh, we, will, we will definitely talk to you uh, sometime after the election for sure. I would love to come back. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you thank so much. You. That is Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark. Uh, she was phenomenal. Absolutely loved having her today. Um, my camera feels so blurry compared to your crisp. Because clean. I follow Fat Kid Deals on Twitter and I got this camera for $10, a webcam. All right. Well, I'm going to need to do the same. Uh, <laughs> but it will be after we bring in our next guest um, yes. who is uh, who has been waiting patiently um, uh, right here. Let me pull off uh, uh, Dr. Clark's name here. Um, Dana Barrett, who is a candidate for, I want to, I want to fix this and do what we had last time. There yeah, we go. Yeah. Who is a oh. candidate for the U S house of representatives. Um, she would cover the 11th district Just mine. in Georgia, which is where Courtney is. Yay. Um, Dana Barrett, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. It's funny the way this picture is set up. I feel like I'm looking over you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, Courtney, I was watching you guys uh, in the last hour, and I love your sweatshirt. I was going to say, I have to show you the sweatshirt as well, just again, to be excited about the representation here, especially since you were running for my district. So um, I had to bring it out and had to crank up the AC to be able to wear it. When so. I when I thought you had that on, I almost ran back into the closet and put on my high heels, high office t-shirt. But I love that. I didn't, I didn't want to be, you know, I, I wanted to let you have your moment. So. No, we, no we want, we that, that would have been there. totally we fine. To, we want y'all to put it out there. We want you to be, we want you to represent all that. So we'll give you 30 seconds if you want to go do it. I got, I yeah. got the kind of <laughs> <laughs> a microphone necklace in honor of you guys. Oh, nice. Cool. We, we love that. We Thank appreciate you. it. Um, and, and just like last time, Courtney, uh, just any questions that you have. Courtney was not able to help formulate the question. She had a really busy day at work today. Um, so she may jump in with, with questions of her own just to kind of um, parse that out. 
Um, mm-hmm. but you have a radio, you've had a radio background as somebody who did a little bit of radio myself, um, not as much as you did and not as successful as you were. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I find it really interesting that you've kind of jumped out of that realm um and and uh, kind of into the political universe. And you've actually held a ton of different roles. Um, everything from uh, being company president to uh, uh, owning a bookstore. Um, talk about your journey uh, here, because there there seems to be a lot to go over and a lot to unpack. Who is Dana Barrett? Yeah, there, it's a little bit of a long and winding road. Um, it is true, but it didn't seem as, it made a lot of sense as it was happening. Uh, when you look back on it, it does seem like I've done a lot of pretty varied things. Um, I'll try to I'll try to do the short-ish version. Um, which is that I um, grew up in Philadelphia, in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, I went to Cornell University and studied hotel administration and uh, got my first job out of school here in Atlanta. And when I came down here for the job interview, uh, it was, you know, 75 degrees and sunny. It was like March. You know? so I didn't really know that the summers were what they were but I was coming from upstate New York where the snow was like up to your thighs. And so I was like, oh, this this place is nice. Um, and I thought I would come here for a couple of years, but I've now been here for 32 years, uh, longer than I've obviously been anywhere else. And, um, and I started my, I really, even though I went to school for hotel administration, I really only was in that sector for about a year before I transitioned. I, I sort of got into technology in the hospitality sector. Uh, and then just transferred into technology. And so the the bulk of my career was really in the technology sector here in Georgia. And I kind of worked my way up the corporate ladder. uh, And to your point, I, you know, I did fairly well. I started out, you know, at the the very entry level and I sort of bit by bit worked my way up. And um, at a certain point I knew that I was not in my dream career, uh, that I wanted to do more, I wanted to do something with more impact. Um, but I also got married during that time and had my daughter and subsequently got divorced. And so I was raising my daughter as basically a single mom at that point. And the technology career uh, certainly paid better than the other things I was interested in, like radio uh, that, or even now politics that might have had more impact. So I stuck with the career that paid for a significant period of time and um, ultimately found myself uh, getting the entrepreneurial bug. And launched a small technology company of my own. Um, And one of the reasons I did it, honestly, was so that I could be home with my daughter when she got home from school. So I ran a small technology consultancy and mostly from home and I hired contractors as needed. um, And I took on some pretty big projects, but when my daughter got off the school bus in her middle school years, I was home, which was great. Um, then, uh, I also, because I now had the entrepreneurial spirit and always sort of had the dream of having a bookstore, like it was sort of a retirement dream. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm a big reader, as you can see, uh, always have been. And, uh, so I decided to also open a little main street bookstore. It was in downtown Roswell. Uh, I did it with my sister and my boyfriend at the time, and we had it for, you know, five years. It was a great experience. Uh, My daughter was able to work there in, um, in her, you know, late middle school, early high school years. And we, uh, you know, I, I had employees and I sort of learned what it was like in that scenario to run a main street business, um, to deal with the accounting end of things, uh, to have staff um, and all the things that you learn when you run a small business. So that was a great experience also. And the, the media piece weirdly fits in to all of this too, believe it or not. When, um, when I sort of had this idea that I wanted to do something with more impact, I started getting interested in media and um, sort of dabbled a little bit. So I feel like I, I would say, I always describe myself as someone who always pretty much had two jobs and often it was one for love and one for money. Um, so I did the one that paid the bills and then on the side, I did the one where I was learning or trying to get into something that was kind of more from my heart. So I had done that with radio early on. And when my daughter was really little, I had gotten in and was answering the telephone uh, at WSB radio and, you know, in the traffic center when people call in with a, uh, you know, a car accident or whatever. And I hung around there long enough that eventually I got a shot at being a traffic reporter and I became a traffic reporter on the side while I had my corporate career. 
did that for a little while and ultimately realized it wasn't going anywhere and I needed to focus. And so I put it on hold. But when I had the bookstore, I ended up getting back into the media world doing some um, book related you know, I got interviewed about the bookstore and then that brought me to a community radio station, which, you know, one thing led to the other, I could go on forever. But um, ultimately I ended up getting involved in radio again and sort of honing my skills over, you know, in small arenas over a long period of time. And when my daughter left for college in 2010, um, that is when I was able to get into media full time. So at that point I did not have to worry about having a kid at home anymore. And I was able to be uh, take a little bit more risk, and so I started getting into media. And you know, I, I know it's going to sound like what well, I just jumped into the job, the job of my dreams. Mm. That's not true. It took a lot, but to fast forward, I ended up doing a daily talk radio show that was technology focused, business focused. Uh, I ended up hosting Atlanta Tech Edge on the uh, Eleven Alive uh, TV network here. Um, for a while, so I was doing non-political, you know, all sort of using my experience in the world of business and technology in media. And I focused a lot in those days on calling out companies and individuals that were behaving unethically. So, but I, but I stayed away from politics purposely because I had clients and I had sponsors and I didn't want to upset anybody. Uh, but I would, you know, talk about Elizabeth Warren, you know, in the Senate hearings calling out Wells Fargo. And I would talk about you know, Volkswagen cheating on emissions and, and the environment from that perspective. Um, and, and when a big political issue would occur, I would try to look at it through a business lens and talk about it that way. And I, I felt like I was having an impact and, and starting to, you know, be in the arena where I wanted to be. Uh, and I felt pretty good about it. And then, as I like to say, Trump happened. Um, and when Trump happened in 2016, I woke up the morning after the election feeling, um, you know, I think what a lot of people were feeling that day, shock, uh, upset, you know, um, disappointed um, and worried. But I also felt a sense of guilt that, you know, I knew I didn't have a big platform on the radio. So it really wasn't about the fact that I was on the radio. It was just about the fact that as a human being, um, on this planet, I had not spoken up uh, enough about what I believed in because I was just trying to go along to get along. Mm -hmm. And I just realized I couldn't do that anymore. It was time to put my own neck out there and say what I believed. And if somebody didn't like me or I you know, lost my position at the radio station or whatever else, so be it. It was time to stand up for what was right. And so literally the day after the election, I decided to speak up about the election and about my views knowing that there was a good chance I would be fired from my from my gig um, because I was working for a very conservative uh, radio company. And ultimately, that is what happened. I spoke up that day and every day after that, and eventually I was let go. And um, I still was not done talking. As you guys can tell probably tonight, I do like to talk. So um, I ended up, you know, able to move over to the iHeart station in town, WGST. And I started talking political uh, stuff two hours a day, uh, every day. So, you know, once again, I felt like I had, I had stepped into my, into my power and I was having an impact and I was talking about things that mattered and I, I felt really good about it. And I had no, still no intention of running for office. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I moved inadvertently a couple of miles from where I had been. I was living in District 6 in Lucy McBath's district. And I had watched that whole process of John Ossoff uh, running in the special election and almost getting it. And then, you know, everybody getting really activated and then Lucy coming in and winning in 2018. And I was all about it. Um, and then I moved. And I literally, like I said, moved a couple of miles away and landed mm -hmm. 11 because of gerrymandering. And on my show every day, I was saying, register to vote, register to vote, 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 vote. And so the first thing I did was register to vote. And when I looked up my district and I said, what is this? What is this district 11? I had to, I just want to interrupt you. I had the same experience because I moved here in 2018 and I like live right by 75 and 575. So I'm like, I had to zoom down to the street. I'm like, which district am I in? Because yeah. it's so gerrymandered. Yeah. And I, and then I was like, wait, okay, District 11, who is this Barry Lowermilk? And so then I looked him up and I started examining his record and some of the things that he had said uh, and things he had voted for and such. And I just thought, oh no, 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 this, this person does not represent 
me or the people that I know who live in this area. Um, and so then I took a look at, you know, the previous elections and uh, I saw certainly, you know, from a cursory glance at, 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 from a fundraising perspective, if nothing else, that no one had really given him a serious challenge. Um, and in this partic particular election cycle at that time, this was uh, last summer, um, so summer of 2019, the person who had declared to run against him at that point had only raised about four grand. And that was her first quarter FEC report. And I just knew that wasn't going to be enough to take him out. And so I really, that's when I really started, um, you know, thinking, could I do this? I wonder if I could do this. Um, I, I like to, to half joke sometimes that the silver lining of Trump is that I think it empowered a lot of people who didn't think they could be, you know, in, in office or who could run for office because he did it. And he didn't have any experience in politics. He ran his mouth a lot, but he didn't have any experience. And, you know, he went for the highest office in the land. So, um, you know, I think I probably had that in my brain for a couple of years. And then when, you know, when all these other things kind of fell into place, I realized um, this was probably something I needed to to go for. And so here we are. So I, so I left the, the airwaves because you're not, you can't do both because of the FCC fair time rule. And um, I declared my candidacy just over a year ago, October 1, 2019. And I've been doing this full time for a year. And it is fair to say that I really did not fully know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because you brought up um, the person you're running against, uh, uh, Loudermilk, mm -hmm. and how he hasn't really had uh, a serious challenge. He won his last election with about 61% of the votes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're in, as we mentioned before, a pretty heavily gerrymandered district, which calls back to what we were just talking about with uh, Representative Clark in terms of what's at stake with the 2020 census and all that kind of stuff. Right. But you're in a you're in a district that is very heavily mixed to say the least in terms of locales. Um you have parts of Marietta, you have parts of Smyrna, but then you have you have Kennesaw, you've got Canton, you've got Cartersville, Adairsville, all these different places that are lumped in this district. Um and, and we also have Buckhead and Sandy Springs. Yeah, yes. it's it's very random. It's, yeah. it, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a mesh. It's a it's a, a, a what's the, a hodgepodge of of West Atlanta <laughs> in the Northwest kind of um, yeah. section of of, of the uh, metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. But you know, do you think this is an area that is ready to flip? Um, and what do you bring to the table that other candidates, aside from the fundraising that we talked about, what do you bring to the table that the other candidates who've tried and haven't been successful uh, didn't bring? Well, let's talk about the district first, and then we'll and then we'll get to how wonderful I am. Um, <laughs> the district um, is, to your point, extremely diverse, and it literally goes from high rises in Buckhead and kind of winds its way northwest and touches a lot of the areas you mentioned. Goes all the way up to farmland and Bartow, um, and so it's it's really really diverse, and it has been sort of traditionally red. But there's a number of reasons for that, and. Well, when you say it the way you said it, that, that Barry won by 61%, it makes it sound like it's an impossible climb. But the truth is that Flynn Brody, who ran against Barry Loudermilk in 2018, got 39% of the vote, almost 40%. And he did that with very little investment. Um, and, and so, and, and that was an 11 point ish move, if you run the numbers, from where the district was. Prior, So it moved basically 11, 12 points with almost no effort on its own. OK, mm -hmm. uh, if you then look at my primary result now, you can't really compare the data in a primary because Barry and I were not on the same ballot, but we were both unopposed, as was the case for the last two cycles. So you can compare historic data. Um, and overall data, right? And so I got 43.2% of all votes cast, Republican and Democrat, in the primary. So I've already moved the needle an additional four-ish percent. And I did that essentially with no advertising, because when I knew I didn't have a primary challenge, I didn't spend anything ahead of the primary to get my name out there. So again, that happened almost on its own. Now we're moving into the general where, and we have raised real money, uh, by the way, 99% uh, from individuals and 80-something um, percent of that from individuals in the state, unlike my uh, opposition is accusing me of. Um, and, and we're spending it now. We're spending it on billboards and yard signs and promoting digital ads and 
you know, I've been out and about talking and on podcasts and throughout, you know, this time. And so we're building our name recognition. Um, what we learned from our internal polling is that we had two challenges. One, that people understand uh, where I'm coming from uh, and that I'm not what the right is painting me. I'm not a far left, super scary socialist, um, which, you know, for some in, in this district is just untenable. Um, and that they understand who Barry Loudermilk is and how he is voting. And I've said many times, this is not an election between um, a, a Republican and a Democrat. It's an election between reasonable and unreasonable. It is an election between you know, a moderate and an extremist. So these are the messages we have to get out. And that's what we're doing. Um, and so, you know, look, whether or not we can get across the line, I think this is a district that is ready to flip. The, the other thing that's really interesting about these areas is that we, we've done, we, we brought in a group called Blue Bonnet. Uh, they're a data team comprised of brilliant data scientists from grad programs all over the country, Stanford, places like that. And they analyzed our district and compared it to District 6 and District 7 across the top north end of Atlanta. So if you look at a map, 11, even though the numbers are weird, 11 is, is northwest and its next door neighbor is 6 and the next door neighbor to that up to the northeast is 7. And we are almost identical in almost every way to those two districts six, which is already flipped, and seven, which was within 440 votes in 2018 with Carolyn Bordeaux, and is very likely to flip this time. So this district falls in line with those. So again, if you go back and look at John Ossoff, in the special election, uh, he came, I think he got like 48 and change percent, right? But in the prior election to that, Tom Price got 61% of the vote. Mm -hmm. If you look at Carolyn Bordeaux, uh, in 2018, again, she came, she was at 50%, basically. She came within 440 votes. But if you go back one cycle in 2016, Rob Woodall won by 60% of the vote. So these are identical situations. They're also very, very similar when it comes to race, education, income. Um, Cherokee County is now the mm -hmm. fastest growing county. county. Yeah. It's the best growing county in the metro area. That's what Gwinnett used to be, which is where Carolyn Bordeaux is. So there's a lot of similarities in these areas. And um, this district just sort of been overlooked. It's truly the last metro Atlanta district to not be blue or purple. So, you know, I've got purple uh, in my logo for a reason, uh, because this district is purple and it is ready to go blue. And um, one thing I kind of wanted to interject too, because, you know, I live here. Um, I was actually, because I actually, I work in Cherokee County, but I live in Cobb County. So I actually, it's unique that I actually live and work in the same district. That's very rare <laughs> for me because of a lot of gerrymandering. But um, one thing is Cherokee County being the fastest growing. Cobb County is also a exploding and me and myself i live right by kennesaw state university which is exploding when i first moved here in 2018 it was just me in the apartment complex next to me now there's three others there's five complexes now so with especially with a younger demographic and it's kind of like exploding and becoming more diverse how do you think that that's impacting your race as compared to the prior races yeah well i think that's a big part of it right so fulton the fulton portion of the district and the cobb portion of the district i think I mean, I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch, so to speak, but but I got more votes than, than Loudermilk did in Fulton and Cobb in the uh, primary. And that was not the case in prior cycles, right? They were closer than, you know, Fulton and Cobb were closer than Cherokee and Bartow. Mm -hmm. But this time, I think we're going to easily capture that vote. And I think he knows it. I think he's really abandoned uh, Fulton and Cobb in terms of his campaign and all of that. He's counting on Cherokee and Bartow to be strong enough to take this for him. But, and I think, look, Bartow is probably the, the, the area where it's gonna be the toughest for me, but it's also the least um, uh, dense. So, you know, and, and Cherokee is changing dramatically. So mm -hmm. the, the, really the issue is, is can, we, can we get enough in Bartow? Can we solidify Fulton and Cobb? And then can we, can we really turn Cherokee? That's really going to be the question. And, you know, I've been quite pragmatic about this all along to say this could be a two cycle play like it was for uh, District 6 and District 7. And if that's the case, that's okay. 
I did not get into this fight because I thought it was going to be easy to win. I got into this fight because it was the right thing to do. Well, we appreciate you getting in the fight regardless. Um, and, you know, we need people like you uh, to try and flip these districts. Um, and, you know, I, I brought up the point with the 61% because I, I wanted to make a point that that's not as overwhelming that maybe as people considered it, you know, um, I think a lot of times people will see that kind of six to 10 or six out of 10 sort of idea and kind of block in their minds that, oh, wow, you know, that's kind of insurmountable. But I'm glad you brought up the point of, of even seeing the shift now. Um, I do kind of want to dip into your platform a little bit uh, because I found uh, your story interesting as you talked about your own personal experiences, which I won't go into. And I'll, I'll kind of let you um, jump on that if you if you do choose to do so. But healthcare is, was a central issue of the presidential campaign, even before uh, the pandemic. That seems like it will never go away. Um, you've been a proponent of, of strengthening the Affordable Care Act. And I think the quote that you used on your website um, or in an interview was that, you know, you don't destroy something just because it's not perfect, you take the good parts and you build upon it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, why that expansion is important, uh, what that can do nationally and here in Georgia? Yeah, I think, you know, I do try to take a pragmatic approach. And I think this comes from being a single mom and it comes from being uh, a business owner. You know, if something isn't working, you don't just chuck it. Uh, that's not always the most practical thing to do. And in this situation, in this country where we're so divided and so polarized, uh, I'm making an assumption that there's going to still be Republicans in office, uh, maybe not all offices, hopefully the Democrats will have the majority, but that we still are gonna have to work across the aisle. And, and by the way, 50% of the country-ish feels differently than the other 50%. And we have to represent everybody. And you know, while I, I like the, um, the idea of a single payer system, a Medicare for all system, I feel like, and I know you guys were talking about um, sort of slogans with uh, Dr. Clark before this, but this idea of, you know, I get very caught up in this bumper sticker politics thing where somebody throws a phrase out on one side and then the other side takes that phrase and says, this is the big bad, right? So, you know, the Democrats said, we want Medicare for all. And the Republicans said, Medicare for all is the big bad. You're never getting that. So, you know, the fact is that it, it, it while it may be aspirational, we got to make progress today. And so I go for what can we do to make progress today? And for me, listen, I've been on the market. I buy my healthcare on the marketplace because I've been self-employed for a long time. And I, um, I have a pre-existing condition. I'm a breast cancer survivor. So, you know, if this nonsense in the courts um, goes through, if Amy Coney Barrett, who, you know, gets the nomination and they do what it looks like they may do and just completely remove, you know, Affordable Care Act, I'm toast. I don't have health insurance, and I'm not as young as I used to be. So um, this is a problem. And I and I'm you know I'm one of I think it's like over four hundred thousand Georgians who will be in that situation. So um, you know I think we can work with what's there. And look, let's be honest. The Affordable Care Act would have worked far better if it wasn't chipped away at bit by bit by bit by the Republicans. I mean, yes, you can say it's not working now and that the um, you know, the costs are too high and all the things, but that in part is because it's been chipped away at. And um, the other thing I like to talk about when, when I'm on the subject of healthcare is, you know, we seem to be too focused in this country on how to pay the exorbitant price of healthcare instead of how to fix the exorbitant cost of healthcare. And I would prefer to focus on that first because that's the root of the problem. Why are are pharmaceutical uh, drugs so expensive? Well, in part because our government has prevented Medicare, the biggest buyer of prescription drugs, from negotiating with pharmaceutical companies. Why? Because the pharmaceutical lobby is strong. Uh, that's fixable. Um, you know, the consolidation of hospitals in these huge hospital systems, which takes competition out of the mar marketplace, that's fixable. Uh, so we we have to start addressing some of those things. And, you know, when I'm talking about the pharmaceutical industry, it leads me down the path to my favorite topic of all time, which is campaign finance reform. Because the reason the pharmaceutical industry is so strong uh, in terms of policy is because we take money in politics from corporations. And then their agendas count more than Ryan's agenda or Courtney's agenda or Dana's agenda or any individual. And that should not be happening. Shouldn't. I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. 
um, because I do have a um, I have a I, I have a question here later on about campaign finance reform. But I, I think I, I was just kind of going through your website and a lot of what you mentioned on there kind of harkens back to some stuff that we've talked about that I've talked about with friend groups. Um, specifically through like social media, just because, you know, we can't go see anybody for real right now, mm-hmm. but, uh, but talking about just kind of pragmatic approaches. And I think you put one on there that uh, really, I've, I've heard a lot of people mention it, um, but I haven't heard people go in depth about it, but it is something that's very important. People have always talked about the $15 minimum wage, but you go a step further in saying that, um, uh, Sorry, where's my where's my question here? You go a step further in saying that there should be the minimum wage should keep pace with the rate of inflation. What is a way that we can ensure that? Um, can you kind of break down the importance of that, uh, and then what's kind of a way that can be done? Yeah. So one of the things that bugs me about our government, and it's one of the things I would talk about on uh, my radio show all the time, is the short term thinking and the inefficiency. Right? If we pass some legislation today that says we should go up to a $15 minimum wage, full stop, that's it. We sign it, everybody cheers, and on we go. What happens 10 years from now? We have to do it all over again. We have to have the same fight all over again. But if we say, no, no, like we've determined that today a $15 minimum wage is a livable wage, um, and this should then increase the same way cost of living increases by some percentage, um, then we don't have to touch it ever again. That legislation is living and breathing and it grows with us. And that should be a simple fix. Businesses, again, who have too much power in our government don't want that. Um, But you know what what the crazy thing is? As as a business owner, I never paid anybody minimum wage because it was ridiculous. I didn't even pay high school students who work for me at the bookstore minimum wage because it's a ridiculous amount of money. It's way too low. It's insulting. I mean, you know, it just is. And so, and and by the way, most business owners feel that way. So who's being protected here? And by the way, you know, there's a lot, I know this is always a hard pill for some people to swallow, but if you really think through what you're, what an employee costs, if you were to decouple healthcare from employment, that would save employers a ton of money. Just a thought. Um, when you think about r- the cost to hire and train employees, um, you know, you could reduce that certainly because you get more loyalty if you pay people a little bit more money. If people don't have to have two or three jobs and they're not exhausted, they're going to do better work for you, which is going to bring your customers back and well, you're going to make more money. So there's a million reasons why this, this cost is not as prohibitive as some would like us to think it is. So, you know, there are times when I say I'm a moderate and people poo poo me and they're like, you're not, you're a far lefty liberal. And this is one of those times, I think. But at the end of the day, I also just am going to do it right. And so I know you were going to ask me, and I think maybe you did not ignore the question about my calling myself a moderate Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, my why I say I'm fiscally responsible. But the reality is, I think you know, Republicans claim to be the party of fiscal conservatism, but they truthfully have thrown that out the window in the last however many years. The deficit has gone sky high, which, you know, is not responsible. Um, I, again, because of, um, because I was a single mom and because I've owned businesses, you don't just throw money at a problem. You fix, you make the thing more efficient. And so to me, that's where I think I consider myself to be more moderate. I don't want to just throw more money at programs because they sound like they are good and they'll get me reelected. I want to fix the programs we have to make them better. Um, and I think that's true for healthcare. I think it's true uh, for minimum wage issues, uh, you know, for campaign finance reform. I keep telling my, my friends and all the people I've met along the campaign trail that to keep me honest, you know, because I, you see a lot of people get elected and they say they're going to do these things and then they don't do them. Um, I, I refuse to do that. I'm a, I live and die by my word and I'm, I'm not doing that. And so you guys call me, like if you see me falling off the track, like call me. I live in your district and let me tell you, I don't get emails back from Loudermilk, but I'm sure his people are familiar with my email address. A lot of people don't know <laughs> that. And I kind of want to circle back to the minimum wage because one thing I kind of see from you know the Republican party, not only politicians but people who you know self-identify as republicans and vote that way that are you know average citizens as well i make 
fifteen dollars and why does someone that you know works minimum wage how do they deserve the same wage as me or um well that's not fair because i only make twelve dollars why is someone that you know works part-time why do they get to make 15 and, and i'm only making 12. so what would you say to someone that's a constituent that had that kind of question yeah i mean i've had this conversation before and mm -hmm. you know i mean first of all First of all, I think there's ways that hiring should be made more fair. One of the things I advocate for is, is pay transparency. Um, so, you know, listen, I've been in the situations where I felt like I was paid unfairly, that somebody who wasn't doing as much as me or who came in after me got more money than I did, and it wasn't fair. We've all felt that way. Um, but I think the point is not to just raise the, it's not to raise the people at the minimum wage to 15 and leave everybody else where they are. It's to pay people fairly. Like that's the goal here and to make sure everybody is paid fairly uh, for what they're doing. And so if, if the minimum is, and again, I know businesses will lose their minds hearing me say all of this, but you know, the goal is to move is to put everybody in a place where they're paid fairly. And, you know, I don't know, you can compare yourself to other people all day long and say it's not right and it's not fair. That's a tough one. I mean, one of the things you hear all the time when people start talking about minimum wage is well, only X percent of the people are even paid minimum wage. Well, that may be true, but look at how many people are paid between the minimum wage. Like how many people are just paid $8 an hour, right? Or eight twenty-five an hour or 10 an hour when they really still can't survive. So, and how many corporations are taking advantage of things like, well, I'm giving you a part-time job, but I'm going to make you work 29 hours and I'm going to make you work overtime. So you really can't have another job and I'm not going to give you benefits, right? So I think if we only fix the minimum wage in a, vacuum by itself, we will end up with some of those problems, Courtney. But if we if we address some of these other issues, like again, where is healthcare paid for? Who's paying for it? What's part-time mean? What does full-time mean? You know, what are some of these rights and privileges that companies have that employees don't? You know, I think we can get to a place where everybody will feel like they are getting a fair shake. Um, and don't get me started on unions because that's you know we can go down that road and be here for another three hours. Yeah. I mean, we can venture that direction if you want to. Mm -hmm. but I can say that that is, we have villainized unions. I think you know, uh, in our media even, mm -hmm. um, and and while there are some things that unions could do better, like I don't want unions to be defending. I've had this conversation with them. I don't, you know, they should not be defending people who aren't doing good work, right? We all agree to that. But beyond that, unions protect people, and the idea that we have villainized them and and, and made it so that you're not even allowed to organize, like what? Don't we have freedom of all kind of things? Like, what do you mean you're not, I'm not allowed? I, freedom of speech? Can I go? So, you know, I think we need to take that sort of black mark um, off of the way we view unions. And certain industries don't need them. And certain industries do uh, to protect the workers that are there who are being mistreated. That's what they were for. And that's what they do at their heart of hearts. Well, uh, you know, it just kind of circling back a little bit to what you're talking about with efficiency because i think you brought up a good point um you you were talking about fixing systems instead of trying to just throw money at the systems um and just trying to make systems more equal so education you brought up something that um just from my own personal anecdotes uh part of my my master thesis circled around higher education cost and efficient inefficiency things of that nature um, so from an education standpoint when we talk about fixing education fixing what we have now what are those proponents that, what are those things that you propose? How do you, how do we currently fix um, a system where your zip code can kind of determine your, uh, your lifelong progress, primarily because of the lack of education you may receive? Right. I mean, these are really, these are not easy problems to solve. And I'll be the first one to acknowledge that. Um, but I do think that we have to move away from ideas like, vouchers like that's not going to help the schools in the in the lesser zip codes right like that I as a parent I understand the um the desire to protect your kids now and if the school in your district isn't good that you want them to go elsewhere I get it but allowing those programs to continue first of all it helps so few students and second of all it takes money out of the system and the money that comes out much more deeply impacts the schools in the in you know, the socioeconomically challenged neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that has to go. That That is not an idea that even needs to be on the table. Um, you know, school, good school districts actually improve property value. 
Uh, they bring, you know, um, you know, well now who knows with the pandemic, but in, in the past, certainly they bought commercial properties to the areas, you know, all the things, right? But then you have things we do like where we, and people love these too, you know, where they get a tax exemption because they're over a certain age and they shouldn't have to pay for, you know, schools because they don't have kids in school. While I understand why people want that when they're retiring, and by the way, seniors need different kinds of protections, and this may be one that does matter for seniors, so I get that. But to take, look, seniors need tax exemptions, but not to not pay for schools. That's like saying, I don't want to pay for the fire department because my house hasn't burned down. Like, I'm not using it, therefore I shouldn't pay for it. Or I don't drive, so I don't want my taxes to go to the roads. Or I never call the police, so I don't want my taxes to go to that. Like, that's not how taxes should work. Mm -hmm. You, the senior citizens, should get a tax break because you're senior citizens. But the taxes that come in should be doled out where they need to be doled out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not happening right now. And that also is affecting public education. So that's when I talk about, like, fixing some of these inefficiencies and some of these kind of weird policies that we make to squeeze things in and get them through um, that just end up hurting us more. Um, you know, I sent my, I went to public school. My daughter went to public school. Um, you know, I, I'm on the board of a nonprofit that works to bridge the digital divide and get, uh, you know, hardware and software into, hands, into the hands of kids that don't have access to that. And in those zip codes we're talking about, and I, again, was listening to your interview with Dr. Clark, who was uh, talking about broadband access. I mean, all those kinds of things impact education, they impact the experience of, of kids in these neighborhoods. And I think the, and you did your master's on this, I should let you talk, but I think that, that you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the statistics are something like, if you're born in poverty in the, I think it's in the Atlanta area of Georgia, I'm not quite sure where the statistic comes from, you have like a 4% chance of getting out of poverty in your lifetime. I mean, that's absurd. So when people, I think people think of America as this land of opportunity where if you're born here, that's all that has to happen. If you're born here, well, you can go be a millionaire. Why not go be a millionaire? But that, that's not reality because you're already born at a disadvantage if you're in, you know, if you are born in poverty, you're not going to get the same education. The parents aren't, don't have time to help. There's not tutors available. There's not after school care available, you know, and, 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 right. So it's, it's, it's fixing the schools, but it's also investing in the community, investing in the neighborhoods, investing in the parents, making sure that we're dealing with affordable housing. Um, you know, that we're not forcing people into two or three jobs because the minimum wage isn't good enough, right? Those all, those all help with the education piece. Not to mention, by the way, trying to help teachers. Um, teachers should not have to pay for school supplies. Teachers should get a break on paying back student loans, you know, things like that. Um, so I didn't put this on the on the page, but I do want to ask you about it um, when it comes to things like climate action and climate change. Um, you know, this is obviously going to be something that is a monumental task that we have to rethink the way that we do uh, 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 that we operate uh, as a country. What are things and I don't know if you've had time to really thoroughly review the Biden Harris climate action plan. Um, but one of the things that I've always touted about it <clears throat> is how it takes an economic approach as well as a funding approach in terms of trying to fix and right those inequalities. Um, do you kind of feel the same way about that plan? Are there things that you would advocate for that, that currently aren't in there or that you would try and revise as a member of the House of Representatives? How would you how would you work in terms of supporting that plan? So I have read it actually, and I do have my climate policy paper up on my website as well. Um, but I wanna, I wanna talk about a book that I read and actually interviewed the author. And you're going to know as soon as I say it, you're going to be like, okay, Dan, you're showing off now. But back in, I think it was like 2000, I'm going to say 2008. Don't quote me on that. Uh, Van Jones wrote a book called The Green Collar Economy. So, and that's exactly what he was touting in 2008. This is not a new idea. It's the right idea that's been pitched all along that once again hasn't taken hold because. We have the fossil fuel industry controlling what's happening in our government. Dot 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 campaign finance reform. But <laughs> the point is that we can create jobs in this country, which is exactly what the Biden Harris plan says, in these clean energy arenas, whether it be solar, whether it be wind. Um, we can retrain folks from the the fossil fuel industry into these kinds of jobs. We can bring some of this enterprise to 
communities that had fossil fuel uh, as their industry, there's lots of ways that we can not only surpass what we were doing economically in the fossil fuel industry, but you know, provide jobs, stay current, and fix our environment all at the same time. Mm-hmm. So 100% it makes sense. And this is another one of the bumper sticker issues where somehow, for some unknown reason, the you know the Republicans, not all, I hate to group everybody together because that's not fair, but a portion of Republicans have sort of decided to deny science, just like they're doing with the pandemic, and to act like climate science, uh, climate science isn't real, um, or okay, now maybe it is real, but no, it's not being caused by humans. And there's nothing we can really do. And again, I fully believe it's because there's too much corporate influence uh, on our politicians. That's that's really the core of that problem. So I hope that answered your question because the answer is yes. I'm oh, down. Oh, absolutely did. And, uh, mm-hmm. Absolutely did. And uh, my my full policy is um, is uh, is on my website. And I have to say, like when I got to interview Dan Jones, I did fangirl a bit. Not gonna lie. I mean, it's okay. I had we uh, I had Sam uh, Park on uh, about a week ago, a week and a half ago, and I was totally like, "Oh my God, you were at the DNC!" Um, so I, <laughs> I definitely get it. <laughs> but um, I do kind of want to. Uh, uh, you've been pushing to the campaign finance reform, and I wanted to again. I was I was buried in all three of my children while trying to write these questions, so I wasn't able to put this one on here like I wanted to. Um, but I, I think this to me is probably the uh, the the biggest standout. Of your um, of your platform, especially somebody who is a moderate, uh, who does consider themselves a moderate, consider themselves uh, trying to represent, you know, a, a purple district. Um, you put in there that you know campaign finance reform, reform that eliminates corporate money in politics, check term limits and rebalancing the power uh, uh, in Washington, and also this was the big one for me that I think uh, should be an interesting conversation. And you already, I think you know where I'm pivoting with this, with your constituents and abolishing the electoral college. First and foremost, absolutely. Yes. With all of the A's in the world, but, <laughs> uh, can you kind of describe, uh, what abolishment of the electoral college does as well as, um, ending the process of gerrymandering and kind of the fairest way to go about redistricting? Yeah, um, that, that's a lot. And I know we don't have a ton of time left, but let's see here. Um, okay, let's talk about electoral college first. Gerrymandering is a tougher one to, to have the actual answer to how to fix it. Because um, who gets to do the redistricting, I think, is the real question there. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But the electoral college is, in my opinion, uh, look, let me just get to the core of this. I believe that this government should be for the people, by the people. And when our forefathers put all this stuff together back in the day, they kind of only half believed that. You know, they sort of were like for the people, by the people, but not all the people, like not the women, not the black folks, um, not the people who don't own land, no, really just the rich people. And we don't really trust the other people to make good decisions. So we're going to put some stuff in place so that they're not really making all the decisions. And, and to some extent, it's the states, right? Because that's really what the Senate is about, too. The Senate is not about equal representation by the population. It's equal, rep- equal representation state by state, which I also think is sort of, I believe, is sort of outdated at this point. Um, I'm not going to fight that fight because I feel like that one's going to be a tougher battle. But the electoral college- I do want to, before you get into it, I do want to shout out one of our um, uh, members, AJ, who has advocated for a long time for a unicameral legislature, but I, 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 and I and I get that. And again, like I, to me, that's aspirational, which is mm-hmm. why I try to take the more preg. Let's get rid of the electoral college first, <laughs> then um, I'll, AJ will get on the phone and we'll, you know, mm-hmm. because I, I, and I do think in the in modern times, the way our communication works, of the ability, the digital ability to, we don't we don't need all these layers. We have too many layers. It costs us too much money. It slows down the process. When we have problems like, you know, systemic racism in policing, no one's even 100% sure how to fix the problem because there's so many levels. It's federal, it's state, it's local. It's, you know, there's all these different, different, you know, people with their hands in the pot. Um, so how do you fix all that, right? That said, um, I know that's not necessarily like, you know, you guys got me, got, my campaign is probably like cringing right now that I'm saying all these things. But, you know, look, with the Electoral College, at the end of the day, most Americans don't even really understand it. They don't really know how it works. 
Um, and unfortunately, the only way to truly change it is with an amendment to the Constitution. And that is a difficult hill to climb because the states that have smaller populations benefit from the electoral college. They get more power via the electoral college. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not really um, fairly divvied out in terms of how many um, votes come from each state. Um, and so there is a, I think it was called the national interstate uh, uh, voter pact or, or uh, electoral pact or something. Voter interstate, comp, I forget what it's called. We'll Google that later. But 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 by the but what it is basically is an idea that if each state would agree to put their electoral votes to the to whoever wins the popular vote nationwide, then the electoral college a college becomes effectively abolished. It goes it, it it's still there, but it doesn't have any impact anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, if you think about the numbers, you only need enough states that have 270 electoral votes to agree to that for it to work. And I believe it's the National Interstate Something Compact. I don't know why I can never remember. I don't know. Anyway, Popular Vote Compact something. Anyway, um, the bottom line is there's already like enough states that there's. I think 170 already electoral votes already committing to do it this way. So it's not that many more that have to come on to this to make that work. But I, I agree with that. I think it should go. I mean, a constitutional amendment would be great, but I feel like, again, that might be a hard hill to climb. But I, I will fight for it at any opportunity that I get. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you think about it, what does it really do? It's only the president. And it's not necessary. Yeah. And yeah. it wasn't intended the way it's working. It, it, this is, I think it's the last two or three elections um, with Republicans. It, we had it with Gore and Bush. We have had it with Trump, where the popular vote and the electoral vote are not lining up. So it's not the will. The president is not getting elected by the will of the people. And that's not right. Well, and I, I think I, I find it interesting that a lot of people who are proponents of keeping the electoral college and against going one person, one vote, um, they don't advocate for the same thing at the state level, right? I think Texas tried to do something foolish recently where they were trying to go to a statewide electoral college system, but they don't advocate for the same things. And I think it's a, I think it's often because a lot of people realize that the Republican ideologies aren't as strong within the country as a lot of people want it to be. Um, and so when you have a situation where you're already only having what, 40% of the population vote. Uh, and then on top of that, of the ones that actually voted, uh, four or five million, what did, what did Hillary Clinton win by? About three or four million votes. Three or four million. That, that's an issue. So um, I'm, I'm glad you have it on there because a lot of people who are moderate don't touch that. But a lot of people just don't quite understand. If Georgia goes blue and you are somebody who's traditionally a red voter in the electoral college system, your vote essentially doesn't matter. And I think it's important to explain that to people to kind of pull back from the blue versus red and just say, it makes sense that your vote counts as your vote and it doesn't, it's not going to be based on what the rest of your state does. Look, one of the things I think in general is that we need to have our leaders be willing to have difficult conversations, to will, be willing to make mistakes. I mean, who knows what I said on here tonight? Someone's going to get me for something. But the bottom line is you, we have to have people who are in these offices who are willing to have difficult conversations, to whiteboard ideas, to think outside the box. I mean, one of the things I loved about Andrew Yang's campaign is he just went all out the box. Like, I, here, how about this idea? What about this idea? And I love that. I mean, that's how businesses are successful. You don't get Teslas and Facebook and whatever because people were just doing the same old thing. Like, that's not how that works. You know, if we want innovation, if we want to move forward, we have to be, we have to have the best thinkers who are willing to put themselves on the line. And I've said this all along, and again, hold me accountable, but I, I refuse to say things only because it's going to get me elected or reelected. Like, I'm going to say what I believe. But, but I also am committing to serve my district and to listen and represent them. So just because I believe something or I like the idea of something, if nobody else in my district thinks it's a good idea, well, then I'm not going to stand up for it. I'm going to talk to the district and see what they want. Um, and I'm going to do the best. Look, everybody's not going to want the same thing. I wish, that, I wish it was that easy. But I'm going to parse what I'm getting from my constituency and figure out what's best for us. And same thing with the country, what's best for us as a country. 
And so, it, you know, if we're not willing to have those conversations, if we're never willing to answer questions live like this, I mean, you know, what good is it? It's just a bunch of figureheads doing the same thing year after year. What's the point? Well, uh, where can they find you, Dana? How can they get in contact with you? you got um, how can they donate? <laughs> um, website is electdanabarrett.com. Uh, I'm on all the social medias. You can click through from the website to get to all the social medias. Mostly it's Elect Dana Barrett, except on Twitter, I'm the Dana Barrett. Um, you know, we're down to what? Is it 26 days left? I've lost count, something like that. Uh, so, My anxiety know, won't let me keep up. I, <laughs> Is for sure, but we've got you know we've still got plenty of volunteer opportunities for people in the district if they want yard signs. If anybody can help us, text bank, phone bank, um, you know it's all digital now. We're still hosting some Zoom events if people want to host an event for us. You know I'm happy to come and speak. We are doing our own town halls every mm -hmm. Wednesday night. Um, part of the reason we're doing that is because uh, it's important, in my opinion, to be available and answer questions, and that's something Louder Milk doesn't do and has not really ever done. So um, I've committed to doing that through the rest of the campaign and also for when I'm in office. So um, that is available every Wednesday. It's on Facebook. You can go on Facebook. You don't have to sign up or anything. You just, I mean, you can RSVP, but you can also just show up uh, on, on Facebook and uh, ask us questions. And we try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, and we anything we don't get to, we answer the following week. So that's available. And uh, you, people can email me directly. It's with Dana at electdanabarrett.com. Um, my email inbox is a little overwhelmed so if you don't hear from me right away i'll get there i promise especially uh the next oh my phone is ringing sorry guys um but uh in any case you know uh, i'm available and um i will say you know it's um it's uh i'm a bit of an underdog in this uh in this whole political scene in georgia right now you're hearing a lot about warnock and you're hearing a lot about Ossoff and you know, Lucy McMath is in a big fight, obviously. So you're hearing a lot more about some of the other races, but this one is is key also. Um, so, you know, whatever people can do to help us out, it really does, every little bit really, really does help. So, and this, this is great. So thank you guys for giving me this opportunity to, to get in depth on some of the issues. Yeah. And then um, I have one question as well, especially because, you know, people, are, I guess, are kind of fatigued and exhausted by just the political discourse going right now. And especially considering how diverse this district is. I mean, we've got Kennesaw State. We've got Cherokee County. We've got Bartow. Um, I, what would you say to voter people who are kind of hesitant about voting in general um, because of the presidential election? Because one of the main points of this podcast is to encourage people to know the importance of the local elections. So what would you say to someone that was like, I'm not sure if my vote would count. I don't know if, I, I don't know if I should vote, if I, if I really want to vote, what, what would you say to, to someone that's kind of having those thoughts or concerns? Oh my God. Well, you got to vote. Like that mm -hmm. is the number one thing. There's never been a more important year to vote than this year. I and mean, we are in the fight of our lives. Our democracy itself is in jeopardy and every race up and down the ballot matters too. So, you know, yes, 100% absolutely vote. I mean, my um, suggestion is to early vote because from a pandemic perspective, I think it's going to be safer. You know, it's more spread out time-wise. I would say early vote if you haven't already absentee voted. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to early vote. But I, I mean, I just, it doesn't take that long. It's super critical. It does matter. Look, when people think their vote doesn't count, that may or may not be the case with the electoral college i'll give you that however it's certainly not going to count if you don't vote and it does count in every single other race down the ballot it does there is no electoral college making the difference in the senate races or the congressional races or the state house or the state so so that argument only holds at the presidential level and so and even there like if if there's a majority then it does and the only going to be a majority if you put your voice in there you know, um, it really is, um, it, it really doesn't take long and it really, really, really does matter. So, and by the way, I will say this, Courtney, like as much as I do appreciate that question, like go Georgia because our turnout already, like the number of ballots that have been requested, the number of votes we had in the primary, like far outweighs anything we've seen before. So, you know, I, I think we're already getting that message out, but yes, mm -hmm. I will at home with every, with, with whenever I'm given the chance, you know. Also, 
you know, I might email Nick about bumpers. I can't, I'm in an apartment complex, so I can't have a yard sign, but bumper sticker. Oh yeah. You can get those. You can get those. We got lots of bumper stickers, like someone one sitting over there on my desk. I'll email yeah. Nick. Let us uh let, let us host one of those one of those uh events for you. We'll be happy to do it. Oh, I love that. You know what else? We've been outside. I did this for the first time last weekend. There's yard sign wavings that people are doing outside on the corners. So we're getting like people in the different parts of the district of like just a handful of people get out and they stand on the corners and wave yard signs. It's so much fun. Like I, I went to a couple different ones in the district um, last weekend. I'll be at it a couple this weekend. It's just such a relief to get out and we're, you know, we're socially distant. We're outside. We've got masks on, but we're, but it's so nice to see real people. <laughs> that's, that's very true. That's very important. Um, Dana Barrett, candidate for U.S. House, House of Representatives, Georgia's 11th district. Please support her in any way that you can. If you enjoyed this conversation, she was absolutely phenomenal. Um, please go to her website if you have the means to do so and can contribute. Please do that. Um, but if nothing else, amplify, amplify, amplify. Let's try and flip this district uh, as much as we can. Um, any final words before we get out of here? I don't think so. I'm just really appreciative of the time. And uh, thank you guys for all the interviews you're, you're doing with all the candidates up and down the ballot. It's really important work. And, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate it because I know how, I know what it's like to be in your seat. So thank you for all the research and all the preparation. And I really appreciate it. Well, we thank you for your time, honestly. Um, you, you have a wonderful evening. Uh, yep. in, in, enjoy some relaxation. Go ahead and get on the wine before your campaign calls you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we appreciate you and you have a wonderful night. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. All right so that is our show today. Um, I need to go in and get downstairs with the kids. But thank you to Dr. Uh, Jasmine Clark and to Dana Barrett for spending time with us this evening. Thank you to all of you that, uh, that have watched. Uh, this is probably one of the largest um, crowds through all three platforms that we've held for an entire show. So Thank you so much. Thank you to Matt Rogers last night for joining us for the VP debate. Um, be in tune for tomorrow. Uh, I think we're still waiting on official, official confirmation, but uh, but we've got a really important Senator interview tomorrow afternoon um, that I'm very excited for. So please make sure you tune into that. The kids work crowns.com is where you should go to subscribe. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure if, if you uh, would like for us to uh, reach out to any of your representatives that mm -hmm. you uh, email us at oh. contact What'd you say? I was like, just let us know because I was just going because, like I said, Dana's running for my seat, and all it took for me to figure out what district I was in because it's so gerrymandered. I had to I had to look it up, but all I had to do was look up her, the contact information for her campaign. I sent an email, a few emails back and forth between one of her campaign people, and we and we had her on the podcast. So they're not as distant as you think they are. And if anything, it's a really great way to to get to know who's running for your district or even who is representing your district. They're not as distant as people like to think. And remember, they are public servants. They're here to serve us. It's not the other way around. So it, by all means, if you have someone that you, you know, you want to know more about and have specific questions for, please let us know. All right. Well, that's it for us tonight. Uh, make sure y'all check out the audio version. If you didn't catch the whole thing, it'll be up tomorrow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Radio Public. Um, again, thank you to Dana Barrett and to Dr. Clark. Um, thank you to all of our guests we've had this campaign season. Right now, we don't have, aside from tomorrow, we don't have anything else scheduled, but we're, we're working on a few things. Um, so donate, contribute, go vote. If you're in Georgia, early voting starts in four days, October 12th. Mm -hmm. um, best of luck to everybody, and uh, have a good night's rest, and we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. 2.30 p.m. Eastern. 2.30 Eastern, yes. 2.30. Right. Bye.